Hi there, welcome back to How to Write Science Fiction That Doesn't Suck. I'm Rick Partlow, and I am a successfully published author of 51 books. I've written 53, a couple more still coming out. Um, I've had a number of bestsellers and make, make a living in what I'm doing, so it's possible I may know what I'm talking about, although I might just be lucky, so that's always a danger. Don't accept what I say is gospel because, you know, other people succeeded doing different doing it different ways. Uh, I don't want you to think that there's only one way to do any of this. I am very hesitant and dubious about people who claim that they know the one way to succeed in anything. So, anyway, I wanted to talk to you today because I had a request from someone to go into how to write differently when you're writing for audiobooks. It's a very good question because there are many different differences, different techniques you have to go to do when you are planning on turning your book into an audiobook. Audiobooks are a very big part of the market right now. They're important financially. And I get message after message from fans who are like, when's, it, when's your next book going to be out on audiobook? Because that's how I listen to books. And unfortunately, most of the time, that's up to my publisher. So I have to say, well, I will ask them. But there are many differences in how I have written since I understood that what I'm writing is going to be turned into an audiobook. And the first thing that you have to deal with is attribution of quotes. That is, when there's dialogue going on, you have to make sure that people who are listening to this being read to them understand who's talking. Because it's easier when you're writing an ebook or a paperback book. You just write in order and you can assume that people who are reading it will see, oh, well, this person, John said this last thing, and there's only two people talking, so the next quote has to come from Fred, because they're the only two people there. But when you are having someone read the book to someone else, they don't say, open quote, close quote. <laughs> you, you are hoping that the person who, who is narrating has enough voice, talent, and technique to make it clear two different people are talking, but you can't count on that. You can't count on whoever's listening, listening carefully enough to understand two different people are talking. So it's a lot more important when you're doing an audiobook to make sure each piece of dialogue is clearly attributed to someone. Now what that does not mean, and another thing you have to watch out for, is that after every piece of dialogue you put in, John said, or Fred said, I've heard it. I've heard it uh, said that the word said is invisible when you're reading. And I know a lot of authors who will use it over and over again. But it may be invisible. It's not inaudible, though. You can hear it. And when you're listening to a book being read that uses said over and over again in the same conversation, it gets really tedious and noticeable and distracts you from the book. I heard that uh, the bad guys are coming into town, John said. I heard that that's a rumor, Fred said. Rumors are often true, John said. But this rumor may not be, Fred said. You know, you get what I'm saying. It's Fred said, John said over and over and over again. You can't have that. It'll drive people nuts. It drives me nuts when I'm listening to an audiobook. What uh, I usually do... And what you may find is a solution for you is to put an action beat in between quotes, in between dialogue. Like, John poured himself a cup of coffee and fell into the seat. I've heard that the bad guys are coming into town. Fred eyed him sidelong, not willing to look away from his TV show. That's just a rumor. It might be a rumor, John said. Or it might be a warning. So you see what I'm saying? They, you, you have one set in there, but you had action beats breaking things up, making it clear who the dialogue is att attributed to. 
That is a very important. That's if you, if you get nothing else from this video, get that out of it. Do not write. John said, Fred said, over and over again. If you're writing for an audiobook, the other thing you have to be careful about in audiobooks, and I'm very guilty of not guilty, but I did this a lot before audiobooks, and when those books wound up being made into audiobooks, which I didn't really have any concept of at the time I wrote them, is, I don't want to say tricky, but kind of stylistic arrangement of paragraphs. Like, I would do things like uh, write like one sentence paragraphs and separate it from the next thing by two spaces just to like make it more emphatic, I guess. Now, if you have a good, a really good narrator, they'll find a way to make that work, but it's not ideal and you're making more work for whoever is doing this, which you they're having enough work. If you're writing science fiction, they may have a bunch of phrases that you made up that they have to figure out how to pronounce. Or alien names, which are worse. Um, I would say that the best thing to do when you are writing with the intention it's going to be made into an audiobook is to make your paragraph structure and your sentence structure uh, as simple as it can be without seeming childish. Don't make long meandering sentences unless it's a unless it's like a character saying this and, and you want them to sound long and meandering. Your narrative sentences should not be long and meandering. It'll be confusing. It'll be confusing for the narrator when he tr she or she tries to read it. It's going to be confusing for the people who are trying to listen to it. Make your sentence and paragraph structure simple. Um, I'm going to make up an example off the top of my head. It probably won't be very good, but just to give you an example. John looked out across the sea of stars and wondered, in this gigantic, complex universe, whether any being cared about him enough to... Take the time to, you know, it, it, you just keep going on and on. It's, it's, I'm giving you a bad example because I don't have that one in my head. But if you keep going on and on, like John stared out across the sea of stars and wondered in this complex and uncaring universe if there was any creative being who cared enough about his creation to look down at John on this planet and want in guide him to a destiny greater than being a dirt farmer. It's like a long, you know, paragraph of a sentence. And it doesn't sound good when you read it out loud. It sounds like a run-on sentence. It's, it's not, technically. But when you're writing for audiobook, you want sentences that are punchy, that are easy to understand, you got to understand also that people who are listening to audiobooks frequently aren't paying as much attention as when they're reading. I know that that's, that's kind of a controversial stance that there's a difference in reading when you, when you listen or when you read. Because I know a lot of people listen to audiobooks and they're like, it's just like reading. I read this book. But honestly, a lot of the times when people are listening to audiobooks, they're exercising. They're driving. They're cleaning around the house. They're not paying as much attention as somebody has to when they have a book in front of them reading the words. So there's a cognitive difference as well as a technical difference of you know not being able to see the structure of the words on the page. Because that is a, that is a big difference, not being able to see the structure of the words on the page. As I said, as far as attribution goes, as far as stylistic choices, you will be forced to make those simpler, make them more clear, it, but also sentence and paragraph structure. When somebody's paying attention to you with three quarters of their mind and the other quarter is going to housework or exercising, 
or when they're only listening with half their attention because they're driving and they need to put half of it on the road. They should put all of it on the road, but I'm not going to go into that right now. Um, you need to make sure that your sentence and paragraph structure are direct and to the point enough that you don't confuse the, the listener. You make it easy on your narrator. You make it easy to convey the gist of what's going on without forcing somebody to replay and replay to try to figure out this long meandering sentence in a long and convoluted paragraph. I think that's why we run into nowadays, in my opinion, and this is just me, other people may disagree, but run into a lot of science fiction especially in space opera and military science fiction, that is overly simple. That the sentence and paragraph structure is overly simplified. It sounds a little bit childish, a little like a young adult or, you know, middle grade book because they're writing it almost too self-consciously with the idea that it's going to be narrated. And I understand that, and it, it to some extent it works. I mean, a lot of these books are bestsellers because people are looking for something that they can grasp in a very simplified manner when they're paying attention to something else. Um, but as these videos that I'm making are not about how to make as much money as possible writing science fiction, they are how to write science fiction that doesn't suck, I'm going to advise against that. Now, if you are in this with the aim of making as much money as you can, uh, you know, in as little time as you can, you might want to consider that my advice may be not for you. And that is not, that is not a bad thing. I'm not making a value judgment on whether this is something you should do, but I am saying that since this is a craft uh, YouTube series, I almost said podcast, but I, podcast takes way too much work. <laughs> uh, since this is a craft YouTube series, not, not a money-making one, I'm going to say that oversimplifying your prose in order to make it easier for people to grasp the plot when they're only half listening to it is not a good thing. It's not, it's not something that is making the best use of your talent. And as I said, you may disagree, and if you want to make money, that may be what you do. Because if you can get a simple idea and present it simply punchy, action-filled. A lot of people made a lot of money that way. So, as I said at the beginning, don't take what I'm saying as gospel. This is just my opinion. I mean, I have, I think I have the right to this opinion. Uh, I think I have enough experience and success that my opinion means something. But, there will be people who disagree, and if you wish to listen to them, They've made a lot of money, and you they may be right. You know, I that's the <laughs> nowadays it's a very it seems like a very rare uh, position to say I may be wrong, but I may be wrong. Especially politically, socially, everyone is a hundred percent certain that they're right and that the other person is a hundred percent wrong. But I am not going to, to do that. I come from a more nuanced time. <laughs> uh, and I feel like I have to admit, I may be wrong. Maybe, maybe that is exactly what you should do. But it feels wrong to me in my gut to basically hamstring your writing in order to make it uber simple so that uh, it will come across in an audiobook 
in a very understandable way. But you do want to make sure that you don't overly complicate it either. And that's a fine line to walk. Um, if you can break things down into shorter paragraphs, you can still use the artistic uh, descriptions, the artistic narration that you want to, that, that feels right to you. Just don't draw it out into overly long sentences. And uh, that may sound that may sound contradictory to what I just said, but like I said, it's a very fine line you have to walk. You have to be sure you're not making it long and artsy for the purpose of it be, being artsy, for making you sound more intelligent, because you are in this to tell a story. But you also don't want to oversimplify it for the purpose of reaching the lowest common denominator. Some you you you're if if you're writing it so that you reach the guy who is you know driving his car or you know at work working on something and just listening to you with half his half his attention. Like I said, that may be successful for you, but I think that you should aim at least some of your writing at a higher target because in 20 years or 30 years, the book's written so that the guy who is, you know, driving his car or working understood the very simple story. I don't know that anybody's going to remember those. I don't know they're going to be reading them anymore. I may be wrong about that, too. I mean, a lot of people at the time thought Edgar Rice Burroughs' stuff was pulp nonsense for kids that would never be never be remembered, yet it is still around. But, on the other hand, I read Edgar Rice Burroughs' stuff, and it is not oversimplified. It's pulpy. It's cliche written to some extent, although a lot of those cliches were established with Edgar Rice Burroughs, so you can't say that they were cliche when he wrote them. But it was also it was also artistic. It was also given to flowery description. Um so I, I wouldn't say that even the pulp writers of yesteryear were co overly concerned with the lowest common denominator. The stories were the lowest common denominator. The stories were about, you know, supervillains and uh, stoic, uh, strong men and beautiful women. That kind of thing was simplified to, you know, maybe the lowest common denominator. But it wasn't... The, the the prose wasn't the prose wasn't simplified the prose wasn't dumbed down and i think a lot in uh, in those cases where the where the prose was dumbed down and there were some like that they're not as famous they're not as well read uh, that's why edgar rice burroughs you know tarzan at the earth's core all that stuff that's why that's remembered now like conan by right? robert e howard is remembered now you know they were simple stories, timeless stories, with um, iconography and heroes and villains who were timeless, who were white, black and white, you know, no, no gray area. They were either good or evil. That was simple, but the writing was not simplified. And there are some that, where the writing was simplified, and nobody reads those anymore. I mean, they, they have a few fans, but they're not... People still read Tarzan. People still read Conan. But some of the stuff from back then, nobody reads. Because it didn't have that timeless nature. Okay, so I've gone pretty far afield there, but I think the thing to remember when you're writing for audiobooks... Dialogue needs to 
be clearly actionable. You need to have use action beats, not just said over and over again. And you need to keep your sentence and paragraph structure a little bit shorter so that people don't get lost and have to rewind it. Those three things are the most important things you can do in writing for audiobooks. And what not to do, at least in my opinion, don't simplify, don't dumb down your dialogue, don't dumb down your paragraphs, don't make them, you know, middle, middle grade level just because you want the audiobooks to be easily understandable. Okay, that's about it for now. Um, I will see you next time, and hopefully I will get this going on a regular basis again. Bye.